This video is going to cover the normal distribution. This will be the second to last named distribution we look at in this class, but it's going to take us a little bit longer to get to the final named distribution. There might be two more. This is the third to last named distribution we're going to look at in this class, but it's going to take us a little bit to get to the second to last, and it's going to take us even a little bit longer to get to the last named distribution in this class. Nonetheless, this will be the most important distribution uh, in this class because it's one of the most important, if not the most important distribution in the world of statistics. To read a little bit more about the normal distribution, you can go to your Biostat textbook and read sections 3.3.1 up to and including the first paragraph of 3.3.4. You don't have to read the entirety of 3.3.4 because uh, we're going to use a computer to do a lot of what that textbook suggests you use a table for. And the table is really the old school way of doing it. I'm not quite sure why this relatively modern textbook is suggesting such an antiquated strategy. But anyway, we're going to move on. Uh, the normal distribution is the first of distributions that's going to kind of describe both the population and the sample side of things. It's going to describe the population in all the standard ways we've seen before. On the population of side of things, we assume there is a population that has a distribution that looks like this. You've probably seen this distribution before. Sometimes it's called the bell curve. I really don't like that name because it's not very, uh, you might think it's descriptive, but it's really not a common name. And in uh, the rest of the world, they actually call it the Gaussian distribution after the guy who, you know, invented or discovered, depending on your take on mathematics, the uh, shape itself, uh, Gauss. So the normal distribution, like other distributions on the population side, has a measure of center along the x-axis, the peak the mode of this distribution is centered at the population mean mu and something like the width at about the point, the width in kind of the shoulders of the distribution, not the width in the tails, but the width kind of at the shoulders, something about where I just drew that uh, back and forth arrow, is the population standard deviation sigma. That is the Greek letter sigma. If you don't like my handwriting, please do go Google the letter sigma so you understand what Greek letter I'm trying to draw. That is not a six, although it kind of looks like a six. <laughs> okay, so this is going to be the first distribution that both describes the population and in some sense that we'll see in a later video is going to describe something about the, pop the sample side as well. Okay, so that was our quick first drawing of it, but let's see if we can do a little bit better. So down here on the x-axis, there is a mean mu that describes the center of this distribution. So a common example for the normal distribution is SAT scores. The people who write and develop the SAT actually craft the test itself so that the outcomes follow this distribution. Now, what we're really trying to say with this distribution is that there's one mode, not like in that geysers data set, in that faithful data set about the geyser. There's only one mode, so unit modal, if you will. The distribution is perfectly symmetric, despite my drawing. All the area to the left of this vertical line at the mean is 50%, and all the area to the right is 50%. So what I'm actually trying to tell you secretly is that the population mean is the same thing as the population median in this case. When the population mean and median are the same number, if you think back to our discussions about skew, then there is no skew. When the population mean and median are the same number, there is no skew. That defines a symmetric distribution. Probability is associated with area under the curve. So the way I drew it, I drew 50% of the area to the left 
and I just kind of put 50% below that to show you that all of that area under the curve is 50% to the left of the mean. Now, another thing you could be getting from this is that all of the area under this curve is equal to 1. This is kind of like the distributions we saw before, where if you think back to the Bernoulli distribution, there was really only two values the Bernoulli could take on, 0 and 1. And the probabilities associated with those values were 1 minus p for 0 and p. Well, if you add up 1 minus p and p together, you'll just get 1 in the same sense that the area under the Bernoulli distribution is equal to 1. The area under the normal distribution is equal to 1. So all the area under the curve is associated with probabilities. This next example is a little bit more tricky. So I'm going to first describe shiftable. In the world of the normal distribution, if we had a random variable, capital letter X, sometimes I like to put serifs on my X to make you realize that that is a capital letter, we would write out X is distributed. That's a tilde. And we say X is distributed or follows the normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared, where the variance is just the standard deviation squared. Associated with that picture, we might have a normal distribution that looks just like we saw before, centered at the mean mu. And I always just write the standard deviation on the top right shoulder. That's just my convention. That's not any particular statistical anything. What we mean by shiftable is if you took the random variable x, capital letter, and you subtracted off the mean, that would shift either to the left or right. But the way I drew this, we're going to go to the right. That would shift this whole distribution to have the same standard deviation, but now it would be centered at 0. The idea is if the random variable x has mean mu, then the difference between x and mu is going to be equal to 0 on average. And this value down here is exactly saying what the average of this new distribution is. This new distribution is now distributed normal, centered at 0, with the same standard deviation and variance. That is what we mean by shiftable. If you add or subtract some value to a random variable x that follows a normal distribution, you can literally just take that whole curve and move it to be centered at a new value. Specifically, if you subtract off the mean mu, you will center the new random variable at 0. Let's try a definition of scalable then. Suppose you had a normal distribution with mean mu and variance sigma squared, and it looks just like, well, as best I can do, the examples we saw before centered at mean mu and standard deviation sigma. If you defined a new random variable that was x divided by sigma, not sigma squared, this new distribution would be, well, really skinnier or wider as appropriate, but let's just generalize it to say, if you divided by sigma, you would scale the distribution to have variance 1, but you wouldn't have shifted it anywhere because you didn't subtract anything off. So it's still centered at the mean mu, and now has variance 1, also standard deviation 1, because the square root of 1 is 1, or the square of 1 is 1. So this is what scalable means. You can literally take something that is sigma wide and scale it to get something that is much less wide. You can also expand it if you multiplied, but uh, that's not as common here.
it turns out this operation is so common that they give it a special name. If you both shift and scale an arbitrary normal random variable x to a standard normal distribution by first shifting it by the mean of the original distribution, mu, and then scaling it by sigma, you're going to end up at what they call a standard normal distribution. That is a normal distribution centered at zero and scaled to one. The standard normal distribution, there I'm just trying to draw us arrows to make sure those names match appropriately. The standard normal distribution is such a common uh, distribution that they actually call this whole procedure standardizing. You can standardize the random variable x to shift it and scale it to be centered at 0 and scaled to 1. OK, so if we jump into R and clean up the session from last time, I'm going to show you a function that's going to help us play around with normal distributions that we assume to know. So just like before, there is a function named r for randomly generate, and then norm for observations from a normal distribution. You can tell it how many observations you want to generate. Let's just start with 11. And you can tell it that I want to center with a mean of 5 and a standard deviation of, I don't know, 4. And here are 11 values from a normal distribution. I'm going to try to show you that this thing is a normal distribution by generating a ton of them and then making a density plot of the generated distributions. So if we use the library ggplot and we create a data frame where the random variable capital letter X takes on the values little x, that's a little bit confusing at first, this is the vector we just created and this is the name within the data frame of that vector. Let's show you. Here is our capital X. And here's the first six values we got in our little vector X. We could actually make a density plot that from that observed 1,100 observations, we can estimate the true density or true distribution the normal distribution. And in this case, because we asked it to be centered at 5, look, it's pretty well centered at 5. And I know it's hard for you all to see that it has a standard deviation of 4, but I'm just going to tell you this is pretty good for a standard deviation, standard deviation of 4. So now what they do in the world of statistics is declare a new variable, often called z, that is the random variable x all its values minus the true mean divided by the standard deviation. And now the idea is if we put that into its own data frame, we should get out a standard normal distribution. That is a distribution centered at zero and scaled to have a standard deviation of 1. And I know it's hard for you all to see that right now early in this class, but I'm telling you right now that this thing is scaled to have a standard deviation of 1. So this trick right here defines for us a z-score. I know it's a silly word, and I'm not going to try to use it too much in this class. But if you see it in the book, this trick right here of subtracting off the mean and dividing by the standard deviation gives us a z-score. This is the distribution we're going to come back to time and time again for reasons that haven't yet been explained. But hopefully by the end of this class, you'll know very well why the normal distribution is the most popular of distributions in statistics.